Hello everyone, Stucker you here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Among all things that I expected to be talking about this week, first off, I didn't expect the whole thing to happen with a U.S. soldier defecting to North Korea. And the second thing that I didn't anticipate talking about was the geopolitical ramifications of the freaking Barbie movie. Which, you know, yeah, you know, of, of all the impressive skills that Barbie has managed to amass over the course of like 60-something years as a doll, I would not have anticipated that cartography was going to be the point that got, uh, that, that, that got her banned from Vietnam. But hey, you know what? Here we are that, that that that's the world that we live in i'm sure that a number of you people have already seen articles for the past month or so about why it is that vietnam has banned barbie but i'm going to go ahead and kind of explain this as to what is going on and the historical context behind the reasoning here the new barbie film starring margot robbie and ryan gosling is set for imminent release but according to vietnam's state-run toy tray newspaper the film's release has been barred with the head of the department of cinema a governing body in charge of licensing and censoring foreign films said and i quote we do not grant license for the American movie Barbie to release in Vietnam because it contains the offending image of the nine dash line. Okay, now for anyone who is unfamiliar with what's been going on in terms of geopolitics for the last, say, nine or ten years involving anything with China, the image in question that they're referring to is the one behind me, the one that I showed at the very beginning of this video. And so right before the Barbie movie was set to release a few days ago, which I'm making this on, what, uh, the, the 24th of July right now, and this thing got released on the 21st, the directors and company behind Barbie went and finally gave statements regarding the entire controversy and what has been going on. Quote, the map, as in the one that you can see behind me here, right here, the map in Barbie Land is a childlike crayon drawing, which, yes, it, it really does look like that. The doodles that you can see on here depict Barbie's make-believe journey from Barbie Land to the real world, and it's not intended to make any kind of statement. But this map, with all of its childlike features and drawn-on dolphins, and even there's a hashtag that you can see on here somewhere, I can't actually see it quite here from the image very well, but there's a hashtag on here that is just bobbing around in the waters, like it's not something that really makes sense. It's obviously very very childlike. This is something that drew the ire of Vietnam because when you see over here with the continent of that is listed Asia, there is a series of dashes across this part right here. This has been called in Vietnam a representation of the nine dash line, which for some of you who may be unfamiliar with what exactly it is that I am talking about, the nine dash line is a line that is put on Chinese maps and for foreign policy that essentially reinforces China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. This has been a hotly contested issue for the past 10 years at this point and there's really no signs of it stopping which means that vietnam is reacting not too well to possible depictions of it i say possible because this is the nine dash line and on the map that you can see behind me here, this line only has eight and is also not in the quite same shape as the one that you had seen before on the other side. Nor do any of the continents or anything actually make sense for where the nine dash line would even be depicted in the first place. After all, we know that the world, um, doesn't quite look like this. Either way, Vietnam naturally disputes these claims because the claims of China violate the sovereignty of the country. And because they're so incredibly sensitive towards issues like this, this is the reason why Vietnam has pulled the movie from Vietnamese theaters. Which brings us to a very important question. Is this map actually depicting things with a nine dash line? Well, more than likely not. As among all things that Hollywood has a tendency to get itself involved in over the past several years, this is more than likely not one of those things as they have no wish to try and piss off, piss, 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 piss off the Asian market. I'm turning into Sean Connery here. So if they're not trying to piss anyone off, then well, what is the purpose of this map in the first place? Like what, what is this whole thing even supposed to do? What's the context? After all, when talking about movies, there's a tendency of people to miss context in the first place, so we probably should talk about it. Well, because we're talking about something that is a brand new movie, I'm going to keep spoilers to a minimum here because I don't want to reveal too much for anyone that is going to be watching the movie. But the gist of it is that Barbie over here is facing an existential crisis within her own universe. Something that is a massive pink dream world on crack. If you have not seen the trailer for this thing, uh, th th there's a reason why people were saying that this thing quite literally consumed the world's supply of pink paint like when they were making it because my god, that, that, that is something for the eyes, to say the least. I'm not going to describe exactly what it is, but holy crap. Either way, this is the world that she belongs to, and she's having a bit of a crisis within it. And because of that, another Barbie encourages her to go see the real world using the map that it has, you know, depicted behind me here. Something that looks like it was made by a child because, well, 
it was made by a childlike doll, I guess you could say. Like, that, that's the whole purpose. It's made by a children's doll, and this is the doll's imagination of what the real world looks like. But the thing is, because we're talking about this map and the purpose of taking a journey, I'm gonna go ahead and say this right now, but the map is more than likely not depicting the nine dash line in the first place, just to kind of skip ahead in terms of context here, specifically because we're talking about Barbie going on a journey, and these dashes that you see here going across the entire world appear to be representations of that movement. So I don't know if I'm spoiling this right here at the very beginning by saying that, hey, this is probably not the nine dash line, but hey, this is probably not the nine dash line. And so that is the context of the map in the film. It's supposed to represent her journey, it seems to be. At least that is what the executives of the film are saying. So it doesn't really make sense for them to drop themselves into hot water like that and ban them from a potential market. It just, it just doesn't really seem possible. When talking about the movie, one of the filmmakers said, and I quote, I'm not sure this map, which you'd miss if you blinked in the one minute mark of the third trailer, is admissible in the International Court of Justice. It is cartoonishly unrealistic. After all, where is continental Europe? New Zealand. What do the sailboats represent? What do the dolphins represent? Is every single thing in here just some kind of massive dog whistle? No, it's probably not. Again, the whole thing is just really weird. And among all things that I expected to be talking about this year, the geopolitical ramifications of the Barbie movie is definitely not one of them. But either way, it brings us to a very important point in this video that I want to discuss, and this is what I try to focus in on. What exactly is the Nine Dash line? What is the story of it? What is the history of it? And why is this something that is so incredibly controversial? Because I've given a little bit of a background to it, and I've kind of summed it up here at the beginning, but there's a lot more to it that really needs to be said. Oh, hi there. Uh, my, my cat just jumped up here. Are you ready for a political and historical lesson, kitty cat? Yes? Oh, thank you. Thank you. She's ready. When we were talking about the history and the concept of the nine dash line the short of it is that it's about resources and territory which oftentimes when we're talking about conflicts in human history that is the reality of most situations that's usually what it ends up boiling down to the nine dash line is a set of line segments on various different maps that have been created by china in order to indicate the territorial claims that the people's republic of china prc has claimed as their own but it's also not just the prc the nine dash line is the evolution of a previous line that existed the 11 dash line that was under the ro the Republic of China, which is now today Taiwan. This highly contested area in the South China Sea includes the Paracel Islands, as well as the Spratly Islands that you can see here, and various other islands that I do not have actually listed on this map, such as the Prattis Island, the Vereker Banks, the Macclesfield Bank, and also the Scarborough Shoal. Here we go, here's a better map of what it is that I'm talking about, because it's also showing the varying other disputes and claims by other countries in the territory, because the entire thing is really an honest giant mess. See, these varying islands and the areas around the sea, the general region, are also claimed by other countries. Things like Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Brunei. All of which, as I said, makes the entire situation a rather large mess, because we're not just talking about a dispute between one or two countries. Rather, the entire region is contesting over this individual area. And the history backing these claims is never really something that was formalized in treaties, which means that everything is effectively up in the air. Nothing was properly outlined, and so I'm going to need to explain exactly what it is that happened here. If we go back in history to the Sino-French War of 1885, where a lot of this dispute kind of begins, then at this time, after their defeat, China ended up signing a treaty with France that renounced their overlordship of Vietnam. China being the overlord of Vietnam is not something that is new. For centuries or even millennia, going back thousands of years, China and Vietnam's relationship has always been something where China was the big brother or father figure that had a tendency to control or interfere around Indochina and the entire region. After all, it has for thousands of years effectively been the super state that controlled things around the region. So then on June 26, 1887, the Qing government then goes and signs a convention relating to the delimitation of the frontier between China and Tonkin. That's the area that you can see right up here. And the thing about this is that when this treaty, when this whole thing is signed and prepared, it does not actually clarify the water border that would exist between French Indochina and China itself, bringing everything in the Gulf and beyond kind of into question. Fast forward around 60 years, and there was a little thing called World War II that occurred, and naturally, this threw the entire balance of power in the region completely into question as it turned everything on its head. Japan conquered large swaths of territory, completely breaking governments across the entire region, and following Japan's defeat in World War II, what we then saw was the Republic of China, what was then the legitimate government of China, declare ownership of essentially all of the islands in this 
region. The Paracels, Pratas, the Spratly Islands, all of this, they claimed ownership after the Japanese surrender. With the claims of the islands at the time being based on the Cairo and Potsdam declarations of the previous years. But the issue with this whole thing is that even though they used these declarations in order to try and stake their claims, the Potsdam and Cairo declarations never actually stated that China was supposed to have these islands. It, it never stated their sovereignty here at all, nor over really any of the region in the South China Sea. None of that. But for Chiang Kai-shek and the Republic of China, that didn't really matter. This was their time to rise in their eyes as they saw it. So the next year, in November of 1946, the Republic of China then goes and sends naval ships in order to take control of these islands after the surrender of Japan. But when the peace treaty with Japan was being signed at the San Francisco Conference in 1951, both Vietnam and China laid claim to these islands. Later, the Philippine government would also then step in and lay claim to some of the islands in the archipelago, though the claims that they were using was not based off anything with the Cairo Declaration or anything like that. It was actually based off older maps looking back at the stuff from the 17th and 18th century. Like one of the maps in question that we're talking about is the Velarde map, and at this point we're talking about Portuguese maps in this time period, and it Everything is up into question, of course, because we're talking about the colonial period. Either way, we go ahead and fast forward to 1947, and in December of that year, the Ministry of Interior of the Nationalist Government of the Republic of China would go and release something called the Location Map of the South China Sea Islands. Which, when they would do this, it would show something that was an 11 dash line, not a 9 dash line. This is the original claim that I was talking about earlier. All of this is something that is based on an earlier map entitled the Map of the Chinese Islands of the South China Sea that was published by the Republic of China Land and Water Maps Inspection Committee back in the year 1935. When the Republic of China still united the island of Taiwan with mainland China, when it was all one state, this is the claims as it existed in the South China Sea. Of course, now you and I can look almost 100 years later and see that the Republic of China did not last, or at least it did not last in mainland China after the Chinese Civil War. Beginning in the year 1952, the People's Republic of China, the PRC, which we're going to try and use that acronym from now on so I don't just continuously have to say the same names over and over again, they began using a revised map with nine dashes, removing the two dashes that had formerly existed here in the Gulf of Tonkin. As for why they would do this, there are multiple reasons, but the general consensus is that the reason they did it is because of thawing relations with the newly independent state of North Vietnam. With China wanting to be the big communist state of the region, it made sense that they wanted to be seen more as the big brother, and because of this, wanted to formalize a more positive relationship with this potential ally. The status quo of this would exist for many years after, but was not actually formalized by treaty until the year 2000. Of course, we're now talking about the PRC, but there was still the ROC that we had to consider, because even if they no longer controlled mainland China, the Republic of China is still a state that, technically speaking, existed. Except now, it was just over here in Taiwan. So after retreating to Taiwan in the year 1949, the Republic of China government would continue to claim that the 11 dash line of the previous years, that that was in fact the borders of their actual state. And so even though to this day we talk about what the PRC claims, the reality of the situation is, is that Taiwan and the Republic of China also still claim to be overlords of this entire region. The guy that you can see behind me right here, like in this picture, this is President Li Tenghui, which is the former president of the Republic of China or Taiwan or whatever it is that you want to say. Honestly, at this point, I'm kind of questioning whether or not the language that I'm using in this word uh, is something that is going to uh, end up getting me in trouble with potentially Chinese individuals. CCP, I mean you no harm, please. Don't try to hurt me. But either way, former President Lee would claim that, and I quote, legally, historically, and geographically, or in reality, all of the South China Sea and Spratly Islands were Republic of China territory and under Republic of China sovereignty. And from this, he would denounce any actions that were undertaken by Malaysia, by the Philippines, or anyone that could potentially intrude in territory that he claimed as theirs. Like, guys, this is something really weird that not many people understand because they look at the tension that exists today between Taiwan and China, but both of these powers have the same claims and kind of support each other in each other's claims because both interpret themselves to be the true China. And as a result, there's more strength in the international community for them supporting each other's claims, if you will, versus working against one another. Like China and Taiwan actually support each other in international talks when talking about things with like the Spratly Islands. 
It's really weird, but it does make sense if you think about it geopolitically. Which, of course, speaking of geopolitics, that brings us to the important question. Well, how do the other nations involved in all of this feel about the situation? We've talked about Vietnam in this a lot, because Vietnam is arguably the biggest contender in this entire thing. But to this day, Vietnam still hotly disputes China's historical account, saying that China has never actually claimed sovereignty of this region. At least not before the 1940s. Like, this is something that is a very modern invention that they're just trying to stake their claim on for the sake of research. Sources. Vietnam says that it has actively ruled over both the Parasols and the Spratly since the 17th century, and that it has the documents to prove this, whereas others do not, that they're just simply made up. The other major claimant in the region here is the Philippines, which among all things is the closest geographically to things like the Spratly Islands. And though it doesn't claim everything necessarily, it does use its geographical proximity in order to be able to make those claims individually on both the Scarborough Shoal and also the Spratly Islands down here. And even though the Scarborough Shoal is in immediately right next to the Philippines, both China and the Philippines lay claim to it, with China referring to it as the Huangyang Island. You remember what I said about geographical proximity? Well, when you look at the distance between the two powers, we're talking about something that is only around 100 miles from the Philippines, this little spot right here, but it is around 500 miles from China, which is quite a lot. Malaysia and Brunei also lay claim to territory in the South China Sea that they say falls within their specific economic exclusion zone, but they aren't the only ones that are involved in all of this. Both Malaysia and Brunei have some claim to the region, with their arguments saying that area within this region falls under their economic exclusive zones as defined by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. Now, unlike the others, Brunei is not actually claiming any of the islands, but they are saying that the region there next to them in the sea does in fact belong to them, an area that can be rich in resources and therefore is something that they do want to control. While Malaysia doesn't necessarily necessarily have big claims, but they do simultaneously claim a small number of the islands in the Spratleys. But the primary issue within this video, as we talked about with the whole Barbie movie, is specifically the relation between China and Vietnam, which has very easily been the most volatile of all the different powers that are involved in all of this, as theirs is the relationship that has seen the most flare-up and controversy and problems over the past, what, 30, 40, 50 years or so. Though in the list that I'm about to talk about, the Philippines also play a part, as they in recent years have had several run-ins with China. The first big incident for the dispute is in 1974, the Chinese ended up seizing the Paracels from Vietnam, killing more than 70 Vietnamese troops when they attacked. And this whole thing ended up just being a massive embarrassment for Vietnam. It was really bad, and I'm going to try and explain the context of how all of this went down. The gist of it is that on January 11th, 1974, the South Vietnamese officials would receive reports of Chinese activity on two of their islands in the Paracel Island chains. And so two days later, naval headquarters would then order frigates HQ-16 and HQ-4 in order to go and investigate. HQ-16 would arrive off of Robert Island on January 16th and found that the entire thing was occupied by Chinese fishermen who who had two boats there and had also built a fish processing, 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 processing facility on the island. Dang it, why can't I speak? The ship's commander would then order the Chinese to depart and would fire upon the island to destroy the Chinese flags as well as the processing facility that they had built. HQ-4 would then arrive on January 17th and put a 40-man South Vietnamese SEAL unit on Robert Island and nearby Money Island in order to remove the Chinese flags that had been placed upon them. Following this, on January 18th, the two frigates would then go on to ram a Chinese fishing trawler number 407, which would then force the very heavily damaged craft to leave the area. The South Vietnamese frigate HQ-5, along with minesweeper HQ-10, would then arrive at the scene later in order to reinforce their position. Now, at this point in time, South Vietnam firmly believed that they had just blocked Beijing's latest, somewhat non-violent attempt at taking the islands. This has been something that for the last six months, Beijing had been pushing this continuous campaign of intimidation in order to try and drive the South Vietnamese out, but this was not the end. No, this was just the beginning of a new stage in what would become more violent incidents. Over the previous years, armed Chinese fishermen had pretty much all but driven out the South Vietnamese fishermen out of the area, and at least two Chinese fishing boats had been caught operating in waters that were claimed by South Vietnam. But the new phase of what we were going to be seeing here was no longer going to be simple fishermen. Instead, it was going to be individuals in China that were part of the Chinese People's Maritime Militia, which was a paramilitary arm of the Chinese Navy that was going to be deployed wherever it is that the official military could not necessarily act. So, if we go and look at the next order of events with the Chinese, the two fishing boats off of Robert Island then have to go back and report to China's South Sea Fleet headquarters. 
On January 16th, the fleet would then order two Hainan Island-based Kronstadt-class subchasers to rush the People's Maritime Militia to the scene, officially in order to protect their Chinese fishermen that were being attacked, but in this case, it was more so to physically seize the islands and build defenses upon them in order to be able to truly stake their claim on them. Beijing at this point had decided that if they were going to resolve the Paracel issue, they were going to do so by force and totally in order to be able to take the islands. And as for why they would decide to do this at that moment, well, there are really two reasons for it. First off, as I've said earlier in this when talking about territorial disputes, is that oftentimes this has to do with resources. And in mid-1972, there were reports of oil around the Parasol Islands that suddenly made these islands significantly more valuable to anyone that potentially had a claim upon them. Simultaneously, in addition to the new value of the islands, thanks to the Paris Peace Accords of 1973, the United States was officially out of Vietnam, which meant that for any of the Asian leaders in the area, not only were the islands Islands now significantly more valuable, but more than likely, they were going to be significantly less protected. When looking at the entire thing, Mao Zedong's inner circle calculated that the probable economic benefit that they were going to be able to gain from seizing the island far outweighed the risk of potentially starting a conflict with the United States. And for every single day that passed, the risk of that occurring, of an issue actually developing with the United States, well, that became less. Mao recognized that with the American government withdrawing from South Vietnam, they were not going to want to risk themselves getting entangled in yet another Asian conflict. Especially considering that the United States kind of wanted China's help at this point to deal with what they saw as their bigger enemy, the more aggressive Soviet Union. And in addition to all of that, when you consider that Southern Vietnam was already being pressured by Northern Vietnam and likely to fall, this just meant that the risk that they had was significantly less than anything in the previous years. So fast forward to January 15th, 1974. That evening, the Chinese Navy's South Sea Fleet would send two Kronstadt-class subchasers, the 271 and the 274, in order to pick up a maritime militia company of around four 10-man platoons on Woody Island and take them over to the Crescent Group in the Paracels. At dawn on January 18th, the Chinese ships would then land one maritime militia platoon on Drummond Island, with another one landing on Palm Island and two platoons on Duncan Island. These troops would then spend the remainder of the day digging in and establishing fortified positions from which they would be able to defend the islands from any potential counter-invasion by South Vietnamese troops. At the same time that this is occurring, two Guangzhou-based Type 10 ocean minesweepers, the 389 and the 396, were then ordered to reinforce the Kronstadt-class sub-chasers of 271 and 274, and these would arrive later that morning. The gist of the instructions that these Chinese ships were given was very simple. Do not stir up trouble, do not fire the first shot, but if combat does erupt, then make sure to win it. Which then brings us to the question of what exactly happened, how did this whole thing go down? Well, in the early morning of January 19th, 1974, South Vietnamese troops would manage to land on Duncan Island and immediately they would come under fire by Chinese troops. At this point, three South Vietnamese soldiers were killed and more were wounded, and ultimately they were driven back to their landing crafts to have to retreat. But the support that they desired was never actually going to come, because by that point, the Chinese ships and the South Vietnamese ships were already in a standoff. At 10.22 a.m., the South Vietnamese warships of HQ-16 and HQ-10 would end up moving into the battle zone, followed shortly by HQ-5 and 4. Only two minutes later, at 10.24 a.m., HQ-10 and HQ-16 would ultimately open fire on the Chinese warships, followed immediately by HQ-4 and 5. But the thing is, after only a few minutes, HQ-4 and 5 were forced to retreat out of the battle zone. And as for the reason why, the reason given was shooting concerns. It's, um, it, 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 it's kind of ironic and bad here for South Vietnam because what would happen is that HQ-16 ended up being severely damaged by friendly fire from HQ-5, which ended up causing it to list and thus be deemed to be combat ineffective. It's, um, it, it, it's rather embarrassing. The overall sea battle would only last around 40 minutes minutes with both sides sustaining damage, but the South Vietnamese ships would definitely come out for the worse of it. The much smaller Chinese warships were able to outmaneuver the Vietnamese ships and were able to then maneuver into the blind spots of those ships, causing them to fire upon themselves or not be able to fire at all. All of the South Vietnamese ships were extremely damaged, and in particular HQ-10, which was deemed to be inoperable as its engines were destroyed. The crew was then ordered to abandon ship, but the captain of it would remain on board and he ultimately would end up going down with his ship. The rest of them were forced to retreat. That next day, Chinese aircraft from Hainan would end up bombing the three islands and an amphibious landing would be made. The few South Vietnamese soldiers that remained on the island were at this point hopelessly outnumbered and there really was no way for them to escape, ultimately forcing their hand and causing them to surrender. Following this battle, China would effectively gain control of the entirety of the Paracel Islands. South Vietnam would try and protest this by taking
taking it directly to the United Nations, but here's the big kicker. Because China was already on the UN Security Council, any attempt that South Vietnam tried to bring up in order to put a stop to all this, well, it was vetoed by China because, I mean, there, there was simply nothing that they could do at that point. The whole thing is just terribly ironic and a horrible abuse of power. And not to mention that even though South Vietnam came out the worst for this, this was not the low point. It was only going to get worse from there. Fast forward around 14 years, and in 1988, the two sides would again clash in the Spratleys, with Vietnam again getting the worst of the situation, losing around 60 sailors in the fight again. More recently, in the year 2012, China and the Philippines then engaged in a lengthy maritime standoff, with both accusing the other of intrusions in the Scarborough Shoal, which, as we talked about, despite the fact that it is only 100 miles off the Philippines and 500 miles off of China, both claim it and are fighting over fishing rights, among other resources in the region. Simultaneously, that same year, though the reports are not exactly verified, we do have claims that the Chinese Navy would sabotage two Vietnamese exploration operations in late 2012 that would lead to a large series of protests in Vietnam. I'm not going to confirm whether or not it happened, because today we still don't exactly know. Fast forward a little bit of time to January 2013, and the Philippines would then say that it was taking China to the UN Tribunal under the auspices of the UN Convention of the Laws of the Sea in order to challenge its claims. Now they were actually going to be taking China to court in order to be able and settle things once and for all. And while all this is going down, then in May of 2014, the introduction by China of a drilling rig into the waters near the Parasol Islands in order to get oil, this then led to multiple collisions between Vietnamese and Chinese ships. Neither side at this point is willing to fire upon one another because they don't want to do anything that is an act of war, but they're going to be doing every single thing that they possibly can in order to make life hell for the other group and use slightly less violent tactics that are still going to try and hurt the other. Like in June of 2019, as an example, the Philippines would accuse a Chinese trawler of ramming a Filipino fishing boat with 22 people that were still on board it. The Philippine sailors then had to be rescued by the Vietnamese, but this isn't the only things that the Chinese had done. Over the next several years, more ramming tactics and incidents would occur, but then in early 2023, the Chinese would switch things up by starting to utilize lasers in order to mess with the crews of other boats. Because, I mean, when they're using these high-powered lasers and they're shining them directly onto the decks in people's eyes, the goal of which is to essentially blind people. The Philippines would also accuse China of more dangerous maneuvers by sailing too close or trying to block Filipino boats' paths or really anything that is going to make things more difficult for them. In addition to these more violent things, there were many more other incidents of non-violent or harassing techniques that were used, such as driving too fast and too close to two Philippine boats in order to try and intimidate them out of the area. And that's only the naval incidents. When we're talking about the other stuff that China has been doing over the course of the past several years, the big thing that everyone had been talking about, at least for the previous half decade, is the fact that China has been building artificial islands in the region in order to try and cement their claim. I say artificial because we're talking about incidents in which tens of thousands of tons of sand, cement, and other material are basically being dumped into the ocean in order to try and build up artificial islands on which they'll be able to lay their claim to the region. But of course, because we're talking about Chinese infrastructure, uh, the, these things have been extremely low quality, and we've already, even over the course of the last five or six years, immediately after these things were being built, seen many of them start to fall apart. These things just do not seem to be built to last and are instead a last-ditch effort by China in order to cement a proper claim to it all. Which brings us then back full circle to this issue that we have now with the Barbie movie, as it is into all of this that Hollywood has become wrapped up in controversy, even in a situation where they don't actually want it. Though, as I said earlier, the overall treatment of Barbie by Vietnam, as well as some news outlets that really want to run with the story, has been unfair at best. It really seems to be that Barbie is not actually depicting the nine dash line that that entire thing is unfair but that all being said there have been other productions in the past that have actually done this and have caused controversy we just don't really talk about them to the same degree that this was occurring this year and i'll give you some examples of it because i'm not sure if anyone is aware of it but this has happened multiple times before if we go back a couple years to the year 2019 there was another dreamworks production that ended up creating this exact same kind of problem with the animated children's movie abominable unlike the whole incident with barbie this is a movie that actually did in the film depict the nine dash line and is something that really did piss off a number of Southeast Asian
Asian countries. And so in response to this being in the movie, Vietnam would go and ban the movie outright, Malaysia would end up cutting the scene that depicts the map, and the Philippines would go and call for a boycott of DreamWorks. It's just funny because this one is actually a real case and did have Chinese influence in it because Abominable was the first co-production between the US company and also China's Pearl Studio production film. So the Chinese were actually involved in this production, which in turn, from what they did, would piss off the other Southeast Asian countries. And that exact same year in 2019, the same thing would occur with Uncharted. Because when this movie came out, considering all of the maps were in it, it would also at one point have a map that depicted the nine dash line which would cause it to become banned in vietnam again considering all the maps that are in this film really i see this as something that was essentially inevitable at some point in time a map was going to pop up that depicted these territorial claims in the previous years though it wasn't outright banned the vietnamese censors would cut a second long clip that would occur in crazy rich asians which featured a designer bag that had a world map on it that showed the disputed area that we're talking about here also being under beijing's control i am sure that there are many more examples of what it is that I'm talking about here, but by this point, you probably understand what it is that I'm saying. You get the gist of all this. There are many cases of this occurring. Vietnam, in particular, is extremely sensitive to this issue. And if you're wondering now what is being done in order to solve all of this, well, the answer is not exactly much. When we are talking about China and its territorial disputes with its surrounding neighbors, in most cases, it's not really a fair situation. When discussing these issues, China would prefer bilateral negotiations, just one-on-one -on -one discussions with those individual nations in order to be able to try and talk to them to get them to see China's perspective. But the nations that are around them do not see this as something that is fair, considering that with the sheer size, scope, power, and influence of China in the entire region, that all of these negotiations are just inherently unfair. One of the possible answers to the solution is that some countries around them have argued that China should negotiate with instead the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. For anyone confused about what exactly this is, this is a 10-member region grouping that consists of Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Brunei, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Cambodia. It's a whole situation of strength in numbers, I guess, to be able to provide some kind of strong negotiating foothold, but China really doesn't want to do this. It doesn't want to necessarily weaken its power, and simultaneously, these countries are not united in their position on the matter. They're still confused as to how exactly they should handle the dispute. On the other hand, as we talked about earlier, the Philippines instead took the idea of trying international arbitration in 2013. So it took China to court in an international tribunal in order to try and get its claims recognized and China at first kind of went along with this. But then in July of 2016, the tribunal then did something that China didn't like. It backed the Philippines case, saying that China had violated the Philippines sovereignty and that it had no right or claim to these islands or region. China, of course, would boycott these proceedings and would instead call the ruling to be ill-founded, saying that it was not going to be bound by this convention as it does not recognize it whatsoever. Which brings us to today, mid-July in 2023, where really this situation and dispute is something that is still ongoing. And honestly, I, I do not see it getting solved anytime soon. It's just, it doesn't seem to be feasible. Here we now have the Barbie movie is just the latest example of something that ends up getting wrapped up into geopolitics. And I will say it once more at the end, just as I said in the beginning, this world map that it's depicting here is more than likely not a depiction of the nine dash line. Just in comparison to everything else, considering what you already see of the world map in other parts, it's just lines that are going and talking about the journey of Barbie herself. At least that is my take on the matter. I want you all to realize that when you look at news media, when you look at online pundits, when you look at anyone who is talking about issues like this, oftentimes people are seeking clicks. And instead of telling the story and history and approaching things in a reasonable manner, usually people try to clickbait others into more extreme actions or thought. The reality of most cases is often more neutral than we give it credit for. And I ask that for anyone watching this, that you really think about things and try to consider, is something like this really so malicious? I don't think that it is. But either way, I ask here in the end that you like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know what it is that we should talk about next. I appreciate all of you for watching. Thank you very much for exploring this topic with me in the history of China's Nine Dash Line. And I will see you all next time. Thank you everyone for watching, and goodbye.